You probably clicked on this video because you either own Snowflake stock or you're thinking about holding shares in the company. And the first thing I wanted to address here is this clickbait title. So we say, we think Snowflake stock is fairly valued at $106 a share. There's a couple of things to note. First, that number will move based on new revenue information. So it's a simple valuation ratio that we calculate. And the next time they have their earnings, that number will change. So what's most important is that you understand how we calculate it. You can calculate it yourself. And then the number itself isn't so important. It's just that you have a number that you're willing to pay for a company. And as this gentleman said, Mr. Warren Buffett, it's far better to buy a wonderful company at a fair price than a fair company at a wonderful price. And that's particularly fitting today because Mr. Buffett is an investor in Snowflake. And we can take a look at their most recent quarterly report from Berkshire. You see here his holding for Snowflake. The number on the right highlighted, that's the number of shares he holds around 6.1 million. On the left in millions is the value of that position. And it's relatively small when you compare it to all the other positions being held by Buffett, but he paid about $735 million and that got him shares at around $120 a share. This was the biggest software IPO in history that he chose to participate in. That's particularly notable because Buffett doesn't like to dabble in tech. He only invests in what he can understand. So that implies that Snowflake is a company that's uh, somewhat easy to understand, and it is. And the other thing to note here is that a lot of people talked about how well Mr. Buffett did when the IPO happened and shares were trading at $240 a share, how he doubled his money. Well, notice he hasn't done a single thing to this holding. He's in it for the long term. And several weeks ago, it actually traded under $120 a share. So at that time, I'm sure all the pundits came out of the woodwork to condemn him for his foolish behavior. Well, Mr. Buffett probably thinks in terms of decades. So as he says, when you buy a stock, pretend like the market's closed for five years. So that would uh, bode well for his Snowflake position. Now, Snowflake, I don't want to get too much into what they do. We wrote a piece in September of 2020 around the time they had their IPO that goes into detail about what Snowflake does. But if you're familiar with the concept of a data warehouse, Snowflake has built a warehouse that's easy to use, that has a lower total cost of ownership, and that plays well with others. So here you can see where the Snowflake data platform lives on the hyperscale cloud providers, Google or Amazon or Microsoft, and that you have data sources that go in. And if you're familiar with the term extract, transform, load, that used to take several data engineers at least to get a data source connected. And now that just works seamlessly thanks to platforms like Snowflake, and then you have this notion of the data consumers, and they also have this idea of a data cloud where corporations can begin sharing data and selling it amongst themselves. It's very interesting. Now, when it comes to benefits, platforms that save other companies money sell like hotcakes in good times and bad. So this was taken from a report, our previous research piece, which I'll link to in the description of this video, which looks at the total, let's say, total benefits, the net present value of the total benefits versus the cost. And they've broken down how Snowflake benefits companies that adopt its solutions, and basically it saves them money. Now, on the right-hand side, we see here some of these benefits. These can be a little subjective. So you have you know, improved decision-making support from faster access to data. Well, how would you ever quantify that? That's difficult, right? Increased profit, I think we can all calculate what that might be. And then on the right here is particularly interesting. So simplified data operations and infrastructure and database management savings. Well, DBAs don't come cheap. I recall when I was a, a dab hand in Informatica that uh, DBAs were commanding, you know, high salaries back then. They were some of the more well-paid individuals on the engineering team. A good DBA is worth their weight in gold. So it's nice to not have to hire so many people to run your data warehouse. And you wouldn't believe how archaic in some of these firms, how archaic their current data warehouse solutions are. They're usually made up of lots of disparate data sources. The problem only compounds itself when companies acquire other companies. So 
when you look at snowflakes competition, this is certainly something to consider. We like to see blue ocean total addressable market. Well, Snowflake is actually having to attack some of the more well-entrenched legacy providers like Oracle or IBM or SAP. And then they're also having to compete with the hyperscale cloud computing providers like Microsoft, Amazon, and of course, Google. And on the right here, you can see Gartner's 2018 quadrant. And it's interesting that I couldn't find Snowflake in any other quadrant after this year. So maybe they pissed off the, the lads over at um, Gartner, I'm not sure. But what I did find on the left here, which is interesting is the mentions among data engineers on Reddit. And this is just useful to let you know what sort of tools are being talked about to give you an idea of the various providers. And of course, we see Snowflake here mentioned a lot, followed by Databricks, another company we'll talk about a little bit later, Amazon's Redshift, Google BigQuery, and Microsoft Azure Synapse. And then you have Teradata and Cloudera. So these are names that Snowflake has to worry about. And in the face of all this competition, they've been growing like absolute mad. And because of that, they have a simple valuation ratio that's very high. So we calculate, as I mentioned earlier, this simple valuation ratio, which is the last quarter's revenues annualized. That just means you multiply them by four. And then you take the market cap and divide that by that number. And here's what you get. So we took our disruptive tech stock catalog. It has somewhere around 430 tech stocks for a uh, fair number of those we calculate our ratio and we took out some select names here so you can see a comparison and of the names in our catalog with the exception of perhaps some few small odd anomalies snowflake is by far the most expensive firm based on this measure it always has been and you can see it there at the top followed by crowdstrike and the list goes down now Snowflake anticipates having $10 billion in revenues by 2029. Well, if you used that number and calculated the ratio, that would put them right there in the range of Illumina and Splunk and DocuSign. So it's very, very richly priced. And the question is, is it worth that? So going back to Buffett's statement, is this a wonderful company at a fair price? What would that fair price be? Now, you may ask yourself why this firm is getting so much attention why is it loved so much and perhaps the most obvious reason is that customers who start using it spend a lot of money so net retention rate this is a great SaaS metric that shows you how much money your existing customers are paying you every year more than what they started so a net revenue retention rate below 100 percent means they're paying you less over time that's bad anything over 100 percent is good because it means your existing customers are paying you more. And a typical SaaS, a, let's see, a great SaaS firm would probably be in the 130, 140% range. Well, Snowflake here is off the charts. And the, one of the reasons for that is because of their business model, which charges based on usage. So what ends up happening is that these firms start using the product. They say, wow, this is wonderful. They start deploying it, saving money and expanding usage of the platform rapidly within the organizations. And here on the chart on the right, you can see how rapidly firms that pay more than $100 million a year have grown between fiscal 2021 and fiscal 2022. And you can see the other categories there as well. They now have four customers paying more than $20 million. That's a significant run rate from a single customer. And by the way, no single customer accounts for more than 10% of revenues. And another chart that, so Snowflake has a lot of good metrics that they publish in their investor deck, you gotta take a look. This is another interesting one that shows the average time from start date of a contract. So their average contract is about 2.4 years long. The average time from the start of the contract to consumption, the contract consumption run rate what this means is when they sign a, con a consumption contract with a customer, there's an expectation that that's what the customer will use for the duration of the contract. Well, in this case, we see that within 210 days on average, the customer has consumed more than what the contract stated, which means that then starts to be reflected in that net retention rate. So it's a great play on the growth of big data because 
companies don't stop processing data. If anything, it just increases over time. It's very difficult to decrease your data consumption or data analysis in times of, you know, when there's a recession or whatnot, they may look to try to level that spend, but they'll certainly not be able to decrease it. And more likely than not, they'll keep increasing it, especially if it saves money. So Snowflake has done a great job of capturing a lot of revenue from customers that come on board. And here's another, let's say, thing to really like about Snowflake. And this is kind of more topical in that they come up with this idea of a data cloud, and it's just where corporations, if you recall, we did a recent piece on data center REITs, and we talked about this notion of companies co-locating within the same data center so they can share internal data. Well, this is kind of the same idea, and you can see on the left there, that's the data sharing that was happening in April 2020, and on the right in April 2022, look at all the data sharing that's happening. And Firms are able to share their data. They're able to sell it via subscriptions. They're able to build apps on top of it. And it's becoming its own little ecosystem. And more than that, it's creating a network effect. So the more firms that start to participate in this data cloud, the more compelling it becomes when you're looking in from the outside. So this feature of their platform shows that they're extending themselves out more than just a data warehouse to become something much bigger. And we'll talk a little bit about the TAM in a second here. Now, when you look at their 2029 target, they're expecting customers that spend a million dollars or more to be 1400 at least, and that the average customer within that cohort will spend 5.5 million, and that these individuals will account for 77% of revenues. This tells you that they're expecting to the old land and expand. So they're expecting to, uh, to really expand within their existing customers, as you see reflected in the net retention rate. And this is when they expect to hit that $10 billion revenue target. Now, if their plan is to expand, they have 6,000 customers. If their plan is to expand within that grouping that they have, then why is there a need to keep bringing on new customers? Or let's say, why is there a need to spend so much on sales and marketing? So they spent $744 million in fiscal 22, 2022, yet they drove 93% of revenues in that year from existing customers. Why do they need to spend so much on sales and marketing? If you look at this spend, it's actually going down over the years, but they show in their investor deck this chart, I suppose, that gives you an idea of where that spend is happening. And this firm has 80% of the revenues coming from the United States. And we don't like to see companies that are that dependent on a single country. So it's good to see on the right here, EMEA, that's Europe, Middle East, and Africa, APJ, that's Asia, Pacific, and Japan. They're growing internationally. And that makes sense for the sales and marketing spend there. But when you look here at the corporate, this is customers with 500 employees or less. That's a little bit confusing based on the things that we've mentioned so far, why they would be targeting these smaller customers. That wasn't necessarily obvious to us. But when you look at the total addressable market for this company, this is what they say. It's $248 billion. And the let's say the data warehouse, data lake, all those terms, balled into $173 billion, and they have collaboration and data engineering, cybersecurity, and of course, data science and ML applications are also something that the firm does, or let's say they've built their platform to be able to handle that relatively easily. Now, whenever we look at companies today, we wanna focus on survivability. And here is an interesting chart taken from their 10K. You can see that over time, you're looking from right to left here, gross profit is expanding and they expect that to hit 77% by 2029, that's great. And you can see that sales and marketing as a percentage of revenue is decreasing over time, that's great as well because once they can cur curtail that spend, then they'll be able to achieve profitability quite easily because they have a strong gross margin that continues to strengthen every year. When we look at cash, because we're always interested in runway, they made hay while the sun shined and they have around $4.8 billion in cash and equivalents on their balance sheet. And if they burned $680 million last year, that gives them a runway of about seven years. So 
survivability certainly isn't an issue. Now, notice we've talked for 15 minutes so far and haven't even gotten around to the $106 a share. Let's touch on that. So looking at share price, $405 a share all-time high. Today's price, $139. Buffett's price, $120. Ours is $106. How do we get to that number? Well, as I said earlier, our valuation ratio target will adjust when new revenue data is released. So um, we'll talk about that in a second because I actually mix well. Here we can go to this slide. A simple valuation ratio you can see for Snowflake, we take the current market cap, divide it by annualized revenues, we get 26 today based on today's price of $139 per share. If we bring that simple valuation ratio down to 20, that's an arbitrary number and shares traded recently at 110, so it's reasonable to think it might hit that number. If we bring that simple valuation ratio down to 20, a nice round number, that's $106 per share. That's the target we've set. Now, notice that the next time that they have earnings, the ratio will change. So price and revenue are the inputs here. So they may have much higher revenue that brings this ratio down, while the price doesn't change. So this, this price target of $106 per share moves every time there's new revenue information made available. And the reason why we set this and we think this could be interesting is that this company is priced to perfection. If there's the slightest bit of disappointment, the slightest, oh, the Rona supply chain excuse, anything, shares are gonna take a dump. And when they do, there's an opportunity to get on board. Now. As they say, when you're doing negotiations, you always have to be willing to walk away. So it may not ever hit a simple valuation ratio of 20. It came awful close when it hit $110 several weeks back, but it may never, never hit that. We may never have a chance to go long this company. And also there may be other companies that come up that are more interesting than Snowflake because we're trying to get more exposure to big data. So that's how we reached our $106 per share target. Now, I just wanted to go back to these other considerations real quick. They were that this firm, as I said, has 80% exposure to United States. We'd need to overlook that if we went long this firm because we typically don't like investing in firms that have such a heavy exposure to a single country. And this isn't really a blue ocean total addressable market. In many cases, they're needing to displace legacy firms like IBM, SAP, and they're also needing to compete with the hyperscale cloud providers, with Amazons and Googles of the world. So as I mentioned, we're hoping that there's some bad news that creates panic, that share prices will drop, and that's an opportunity to buy a wonderful company at a fair price. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on briefly is the comparison you see here between a company called Databricks that's said to be looking to IPO this year and Snowflake. So that could be another interesting option for those looking to get some exposure to data, though we do like to only invest in leaders. And to be honest with you, it's very difficult right now to say who's a leader because you can go and do some Googling on market share estimates for Snowflake versus its competitors and they're very, there's a lot of variation and it's very difficult to find any sort of concrete number. So that whole idea we have about only investing in leaders, we need to assume that Snowflake will eventually be a leader because they're making such good progress. So it's certainly a quality company by any measure, SaaS or otherwise, at an expensive price. And it's been consistently expensive over time. You need to determine your own fair price and maybe that's what it sits at today. Certainly a fair price might be what Warren Buffett was willing to pay several years ago or coming up on several years ago. So determine your own fair price. Ours, we'd possibly go long at a simple valuation ratio of 20 or less. We've set that rule. We're happy if it never triggers, if it does, we're happy. And of course, as I said, as long as our thesis doesn't change, we may find something more compelling to occupy our portfolio, but Snowflake is certainly on our radar as a big data company that we like. So. Please leave your comments in the comments section. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today.